We're glad that you're here. Hope you've had a good day. It's been a good day in many ways. We hope that you've had a good day, especially. Tonight we continue our series. Uh, we've got a couple more lessons. We're going to look at victory over pride next week, and then we're going to the next week as we close out the series. We're going to look at victory over a bad attitude. And so if you have a bad attitude, uh, come. What was it that woman said on that show you was watching a while ago? She said that she wasn't crazy. She still Magnolia. She said, I'm not crazy. I've just been in a bad mood for 40 years. So uh, I walked in on that. I thought that's pretty good. <laughs> Save that for a bad attitude. But t- tonight we want to look at anger. It happens, doesn't it? Joe's asleep. Joe's awakened about sunrise one morning. There was a bird that was pecking on his gutters of his home, and he was aggravated. And he laid there, and it seemed like the longer he laid there, the madder he got. And not only the madder he got, but the louder that bird got. And so finally he decided to find out exactly what the problem was, so he went outside. When he went outside, he found that bird beating on, pecking on his gutter. He was mad. So he took a rock. There was a rock in his yard. must have been from Middle Tennessee. There was a rock in his yard, and he picked it up, and he threw it at the bird, only to watch it sail over the house and all of a sudden to hear a crash of what was the car window. Now he's even madder. He's mad because he threw the rock. He's mad because now he's going to have to fix a window. And it's about that time then, as he continues to look at that bird, still pecking away, that he thinks, well, you know, all right, what am I going to do? And he kicks the ground, only then to remember when his toe hit the rock that was on the ground, he had on no shoes. Sound familiar? Anger. Anger is something that hits us a lot of times and it comes over us like a tidal wave. I mean, it just runs over us. We get mad, we get frustrated, we get angry. We get angry at a lot of different things. Sometimes we get angry at our spouse. Sometimes, sometimes our spouses get angry at us. Sometimes we get angry at our children. Sometimes we get angry at life. Sometimes we get angry at that guy that's driving in front of us. Because that stupid guy doesn't know how to drive. Sometimes we get angry with our neighbor because they're doing something that seemingly is infringing upon our property. Sometimes we get angry out at stores because we just don't seem like they're doing us right. We get angry at the person that cut in front of us lying while we were waiting We get angry, and we get angry about a lot of things. But we have to understand, and we will see in just a few minutes, that there is a sense in which anger can be productive. And there is a sense in which it is wrong. And that's really what we're talking about. So if you you have maybe a short fuse, if you get angry, we'll learn how maybe to deal with it a little bit. But we'll also learn the fact that sometimes it can be good if it's channeled the right way. My wife carried my son a long time ago. He's a little fella. And they were at Walmart. And Ethan did not have too many meltdowns. But Ethan evidently, according to the story, and Suzanne tells this story far better than I, but Ethan evidently had a meltdown in store. And this lady walked up to him and said, as she looked at his beautiful red hair, said, I know where you got that temper. And she looked at my wife, also with beautiful red hair. My wife really is sweet. I told you all that Wednesday night, and she really is, especially to you folks. (laughs) But she looked at that woman square in the eye, and she said, no, ma'am. Said he gets his temper from his daddy, and his daddy has blonde hair. Nah, he has no hair. But anger. What about anger? What does the Bible have to say about anger? Well, Psalms 37 and verse 8. 
The psalmist says, cease from anger and forsake wrath. And the reason being, because he says, to paraphrase, he says, nothing good happens. And so he says, cease from anger. In Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 18, the wise man said, the wrathful man stirs up strife. How does he do that? Because he's full of anger. And once again, in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 32, he that is slow to anger or slow to wrath is better than he that controls the city. Solomon said, it's better to be slow to anger than one that controls the city. Boy, we would think, oh no, you got to have that man that controls the city. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 9 says, be not rash with your mouth. For out of anger he comes, or it speaks. Don't be angry. Don't be soon angry. Solomon was right in his wisdom. Be slow, slow to anger. James 1, we'll talk about that in a minute. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 22. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount that whosoever is angry with his brother is in danger of hell fire. Huh. Boy, that's strong, isn't it? Don't grow angry with your brother. Matter of fact, Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount what? Whosoever compels you to go with him, I'll go with him too. That's important in the idea of patience. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31. Put away all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking. Paul is talking about the new man. And when he talks about the new man, he says, all right, as he's gone through some characteristics, he says, put off. And he says, one of the things you put off is anger. And then Titus chapter 1, verse 7, we looked at here a couple of weeks ago on Wednesday night. One of the qualifications for an elder is not soon be angry. And then James chapter 1, verse 19, one that we're probably the most familiar with. It would be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Now, I want you to remember that verse. I'm going to come back to it again, but I'm going to go on and explain something about that verse. That's interesting when you begin to study the, the language aspect of it. That James says, let every man be swift to hear, slow to anger, slower still, swift to hear, slow to speak, excuse me, and slower still to anger. So you're swift to hear, but you're slow to speak, and you're slower still to anger. Try to put it off. That's what the Bible says about anger. Anger then, we can conclude, according to some of these passages, anger can get you in trouble. Anger grasped in the bosom of the fool. Anger is something to be put away. It doesn't do any good. So, anger. Anger is sinful. But anger is sinful when? Well, it's sinful, first of all, when it's selfish. When it only wants what it wants. Anger, when it's selfish, is wrong. story of Cain and Abel come to mind, don't they, in Genesis, the fourth chapter. Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, and Cain began to grow angry, and Cain, of course, we know, killed, right? He didn't like what was going on. He was selfish. His anger came out of a selfishness. I want to be accepted. Well, you should have done what was right. You should have done what God wanted you to do. You should have, have served God in a way that God would have accepted you and thus not be concerned about yourself. When anger is centered upon self, you see, I didn't get my way. I didn't get what I thought was fair. I didn't get what I thought was right. I didn't get what I wanted done. I didn't get my way. When that anger begins to fester when we, we grow angry from that standpoint, and it's only about us, and the Bible tells us that anger is wrong. Well, anger can also be vengeful. There's a great example of this in the Bible, in Hebrews chapter 10. We find that, that anger, God says we're to do what? Well, he says the same thing in Romans chapter 12. We're to live at peace because God has proclaimed vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. When anger becomes vengeful, when we're only trying to get even with somebody. Now, 
we see it and and there are shows on tv I, I don't watch those shows my wife watches them by the way if i ever wind up dead under suspicious circumstances or maybe even not suspicious circumstances please check her out she's watched way too many shows but and that's what she likes to watch and i'd rather watch a ball game and so that makes us different and that's why we have two tvs <laughs> but but you see on a lot of those shows that Sue's watches, you see a lot of folks that got mad, got angry, and they went out and they killed somebody. Well, maybe you've experienced it not from the standpoint of vengeance, from the standpoint of being killed, <laughs> because you're here, but vengeance from the standpoint of they've done something to you. They got even with you. They got back at you for something that they either believe you did, supposed you did, think you did, or just have made up that you did, or maybe really you did it. And when they got back at you, they didn't let God take care of it. And their anger then became sinful. Why? Because there was vengeance in their anger. Anger is sinful when it's born of an insensitive spirit, when it's born of a spirit that, that doesn't feel for people. Jonah, a prophet of God. Jonah was told to go to Nineveh and preach the gospel, right? Go and preach the gospel. Jonah decided that that's not what he wanted to do. Now, it's believed that we, because we don't, the Bible really doesn't give us a reason. But it's believed that Jonah really didn't want Nineveh to hear the, the truth because Nineveh was not an accepted, if you will, folks with regards to the way the Jews looked at. It. Now, that may have been it, and there may have been another reason. Whatever the reason was, Jonah really didn't want to go to Nineveh. He didn't want to preach, and so Jonah ran away. God got Jonah's attention. You know, we've talked about that before a little bit, not much, about the fact that God has a way sometime of getting our attention. And God got Jonah's attention. There was a, a, a rather large fish, if you will, that swallowed up Jonah. And Jonah then, of course, was, was cast out upon the ground. And, and Jonah said, well, I believe I'll go to Nineveh. And Jonah went there in Jonah chapter 2, and he preached. And in Jonah chapter 3, here's what we see. We see Nineveh repenting. We see Jonah repenting. And we see God repenting. We see Jonah, let's take Jonah first. Jonah repenting because he decides, okay, I need to go because that's where God wants me to go. So I'm going to change. And, and, and that's really a big part of repentance is the idea of changing. He changed his mind and changed his direction and decided to do what God wanted him to do instead of what he wanted to do. So he goes to Nineveh, he preaches. We see the repentance of Nineveh in that they heard the truth and they said, well, we're wrong. Now, I will say this, sadly, that after a period of time, Nineveh went back to their wicked ways because Nahum, another prophet, has to go back later on and preach again to, to Nineveh. But nevertheless, they repented. And then in Jonah chapter 3, verse 10, it seems like to us a most, most unlikely thought. It says that God repented. Well, God's repentance wasn't because of sin that he had done. It was just a change of mind. I'm not going to destroy Nineveh. Because you see, that was the preaching of Jonah. If you don't straighten up, you're going to be destroyed. Well, when they straightened up, God says, I'm not going to destroy them. In Jonah chapter 4, guess who's mad? Jonah. Why? Well, because Nineveh had repented. The only preacher that had success that I know of that ever got mad was Jonah. But Jonah saw that Nineveh repented and saw that God wasn't going to destroy them, so he grew angry, an insensitive spirit. Jonah also really then shows us anger, if you keep reading in Jonah chapter 4, of really 
Anger is sinful when it concerns petty things, little things, things that don't matter. Jonah had gone out, if you will, outside the city and sat on a little hill. He wanted to watch Nineveh be destroyed. The sun was hot. It was baking him. And so God prepared, if you will, a, a vine, a gourd probably of some sort. It grew overnight, and it shaded him. And he was angry because Nineveh wasn't destroyed. And in Jonah chapter 4, it said that God prepared a worm. And that worm would be, if you've ever raised tomatoes, you know about a cutworm, right? You've ever experienced cutworms? You know, you grow the tomato plant, it looks beautiful. Today, tomorrow, you go out there and something's happened. You dig around the, the base of it and you'll find a green worm that's basically strangled the plant, cut it into, called cutworm in West Tennessee. Don't know really what's called in Middle Tennessee. It's just a nuisance. God prepared some kind of worm. And guess what Jonah did? He got mad. Over what? The fact that a vine that God had prepared, God had basically killed. God was trying to get Jonah's attention. But Jonah got mad and his anger became sinful really when it was over something that really didn't matter. We often get angry over things that don't matter, little things. And then it becomes angry when we vent ourselves. And we vent ourselves in foolish ways, and we vent ourselves in ways that are not lawful. Remember in Kadesh, Numbers, the 20th chapter? Do you remember the story that children of Israel, for lack of a better term, needed water, and so God told Moses, speak to the rock? Moses got mad, wanted to show God up, so what did he do? Struck the rock. He was going to show everybody, you know, how it was. He vented himself. He vented in a way that was unlawful, a way that was contrary to the will of God, a way that was contrary to the way God wanted it done. That's when anger is wrong, when it vents itself unlawfully, when it goes against the very nature, the very attributes that God would have us to have. And then anger is is sinful, lastly, when it causes others to sin. You know, anger, anger can grow, right? If you're familiar with, with baseball people, you know you've probably heard of Mickey Mantle and Billy Martin. Now, you might remember Billy Martin from the standpoint of manager of the New York Yankees and Mickey Mantle being a player, but Billy also was a player. Well, these two fellows were really good friends. And it was one of the off seasons. They were down in Texas. They were going to go hunting. Billy knew, uh, or excuse me, uh, Mickey knew of a guy that had a, a ranch and he had let them fa- he'd let them hunt on it a, a lot and so they decided that they were going to go to that ranch and they were going to go hunting and they got there that morning and mickey looked at bill and he said hey he said we need to stop here at the house i need to ask i need to make sure i haven't asked and i need to ask to make sure that it's all right that we can hunt and so billy said fine and so Mickey went up to the door and he knocked and his friend welcomed him in. After just a couple of minutes of conversation, he said, oh, Mickey said, it's it's fine to to hunt on the property. You know that, but appreciate you asking. But he said, I got an old mule that's in the barn. He said, I I do want to ask you a favor. Got an old mule that's in the barn and and she's getting blind and she's also got some other health issues and I really just need need to lay her down, but I just don't have the heart. I've had her for years, and she's just part of the family. Could you could you at least you know shoot her and kill her and put her out of her misery, and and I'll take care of disposing of her. Billy said, "Okay." He stomped out of the house told Billy to open the trunk of the car. They opened the trunk. He pulled out his gun. He said, I'm going to show him. He said, I can't believe it. He won't let us hunt. 
He said, I, I can't believe it. I, I can't believe it. He's done it all these years, but now he just won't let us do anything. And he went out and bam, he shot that mule. But about the time he shot that mule, he heard two more shots. He thought, what in the world is going on? Mickey went back to the car and Billy ran and jumped in. He says, hurry up, we got to go. He said, I showed him I got two of his cows. Sometimes anger grows, and it causes others to sin. Solomon made a statement in the book of Proverbs. He said, he said the beginning of, of strife is like letting water out. You ever let water out? You ever dammed water up, and then all of a sudden you let it out? What happens? Boy, it, shoo, till it all evens out, right? Well, Solomon said that's how anger is sometimes. So we have to be careful that anger is sinful. But let us understand, I want you to understand, I don't have a slide for this. Anger is not always sinful. Anger is not always sinful. God is said to have grown angry. Matter of fact, in the Old Testament alone, there are some 80 times in which it said God got angry. Angry. Well, we, we could talk about a lot of those. We could talk about God's anger with the children of Israel. We could talk about God's anger with, <coughs> excuse me, with Uzziah when he <coughs> numbered the people. And God had said not to be numbered, and it's God got angry. God got angry. Jesus got angry. Matter of fact, there are four times in the New Testament where Jesus got angry, two of them was cleansing the temple. I believe there were more than one cleansing of the temple. There was two. Jesus would go up to the temple and there would be money changers. Now, you got to understand, money changers were basically there for business. Shouldn't have been, but they were. When you went to the temple, you had to have A, certain sacrifice, and B, you could only contribute a certain type of money to the treasury. And when... You didn't have it. You'd come from a long journey. You couldn't have bring your sacrifices, and you came from a long journey, and you, you had not found anywhere to, to get money exchanged because the, there weren't just places everywhere you could do that. There were fellows up at the temple that did that. And, of course, they were making money off of it. And Jesus said, no. Remember, he made, out, he made a, a whip. He ran the money changers out. He threw over the tables. Do you think he did that like this? Oh, it's all right, fellas. Y'all just go on. No, he got angry. And he did it not once, but twice. Jesus grew angry. Jesus grew angry at other times as well. Jesus, though, when he grew angry, you got to remember that he, his anger was never out at a particular individual. Never did he belittle the individual. His anger was always at an injustice. His anger was always uh, trying to promote the good of people. You see, you and I might get angry. We might get angry that there's a law in this land that we don't like, and so we might, might lead a push to get the, the law changed. We might not like something in our community and we grow angry about it, and so we go about to get it changed. We may not like something about us, and we may grow angry about whatever it is with us, and we may then work on changing us. So anger in and of itself is not always wrong. But it is when we act in ways that are contrary to God's law. So... Understanding the difference, we say, okay, well, I really don't have the, I don't have the, the good anger, if you will. I have bad anger. I get mad from time to time. I boil over. I, 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 you know, I have problems. I've dealt with people. They talk about holes in their walls, and they talk about other issues that they have. Sort of like the woman that called the counselor one time. She said, she told, called him in the middle of the night, and she told him who, he, who she was, and. He said, yes. And she said, you remember we came last week for counseling? And he said, well, refresh me. And she said, well, I'm the one that had the husband that 
that threw the ball through the TV and took the trophies and, and knocked them winding and, and, and tore up the, the coffee table. He said, oh, yes, I remember you. She said, well, that's all right. I did it tonight, so we'll be seeing you tomorrow. Well, you see, you, you got a problem there. How do we overcome that? Well, first of all, we've got to learn to drop it, don't we? We've got to learn to let it go. Proverbs 17, verse 14. Solomon reminds us, that the beginning of strife is like unleashing. That's the verse I used a while ago, the unleashing of water. Sometimes we have to learn to just drop it. My wife has an expression that you've probably used as well, but she says, learn to pick your battles. You see, sometimes we have to ask ourselves, is what I'm mad at right now, is it worth the damage that I'm causing? Because of my anger. A lady one time told a counselor, said, you know, said, I grow angry from time to time. When I grow angry, I'm just, I'm like a, a shotgun. I just shoot and then it's all over with. And the counselor looked at her and he said, yes. He said, I see you think there's redeeming value in that. But he says, do you see the destruction that a shotgun makes? She said, no, I never thought about it that way. You see, sometimes it's just best to drop it. It's best to, to go your way and just say, okay, it is what it is. And that's all we can do about it. But in victory over anger, we need to slow down. We, we looked at James 1 a while ago, and we talked about how that James says that we're to be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. That there's a process. That sometimes we just need to slow down. Yeah, the old adage, count to ten, it works. It works. I, I've used it with people that I've told them in counseling that, that, that they would want to talk to me. And, okay, well, you know, we're not having the best relationships. Okay, well, what's the problem? Well, we, we, we get in arguments, and they get pretty, pretty heated at times. Have you tried counting to ten? They look at you like you're an idiot, which is fine. Because, I mean, you know, okay. But they come back and they say, you know, when we slowed down a little bit, when we thought about it, when we reasoned through it, when we, when we spent time thinking about it and we spent time mulling over for just at least for a few minutes what we were all upset about, when we just slowed down, when we caught our breath, we realized that it wasn't worth it. And so we're slow. Slow to anger. But then work on your self-control, wasn't it, Felix, that when Paul reasoned of righteousness and temperance or self-control, that he told him to go his way, told Paul to go away. We don't like the idea of self-control because self-control says there are times in our lives in which we have to say no to ourselves. There are times in our lives in which we just simply have to say, no, nah, I, I can't do that, not going to do that. That's not for me. It's important that we learn the very practice of self-control. The heart of the righteous man studieth to answer. Proverbs 15 and verse 28. Work on controlling yourself. Work on getting yourself under control because that's what God wants of us. He wants us as Christians to be in control. Now, you might say, and I realize some of you are going to walk out and, and either think or say to me, and, and I think justifiably so, you're going to say, wait a minute. If I had doubt and I had this philosophy, the world's going to run over me. Well, maybe, maybe not. Well, let me ask you. You've got two choices. The world can run over you or God can be pleased with you. Now, which one do you want? Well, preacher, that's a little blunt. I, I realize that. But that's where we have to work on ourselves. Work on our control. Work on, on, on getting a hold of our emotions because that's where anger comes from. It's an injustice that we feel that causes us to lash out. At others. And so we need to analyze the situation. 
We need to look at it, study the situation, analyze it. See what is really going on. Why did they do? Why did they say what they said to me? Why did they do to me what they did to me? And will it do any good for me to do it back to them? Sometimes we don't know the hurt that's going on in people's lives. And sometimes they don't want to tell us and they don't want to talk about it. And to be honest, we can't talk to them about it. Why? Because they don't want to talk. And us sitting there with them and trying to pry it out of them is of no value. Back several years ago, one of our members where I was at the time was having some blood pressure issues. And I kind of knew what was going on. I didn't know I didn't know all the details, but I kind of knew what was happening. So one day, his wife called me, and she said, he's in the hospital. Same problem. I said, this is bad, though, this time. Will you go see if you can talk to him? And see if he'll talk to you and open up. And we were good friends. We would played golf a couple of times together, and we'd gone out and uh, times together or we'd sit together when all the men of the congregation would go out we'd sit together and talk and we'd be the the last two at the church building because he locked up the church building we'd be the last two church building talk to him really good guy had in early years he had done a little preaching he had actually gone to school to make a preacher but he didn't feel like he could cut it and could make a living for his family and so he'd gotten into something else but a really good guy but the day his wife called me. I was actually at uh, at, a, at a meeting in Dixon with much preachers, and uh, so I left and I went to the hospital. And I sat and watched Bonanza with him. And I asked him a couple of times. I said, Do "You want to talk?" No. Okay. So I just sat there. A few minutes later, I asked him. I said, "Hey, you want to talk?" Don't tell me about it. Nope. Okay. Wasn't long before blood pressure problems kicked in. He died. Wasn't long. Wasn't a month or two after that. And I was sitting in the hospital in the waiting room with quite a few members of the church. We usually had there in Dixon, Pomona, we we uh, somebody passed away like that, especially unexpectedly the hospital, we'd usually take over the waiting room and just sit there for a couple hours and talk, talk it out. And we sat there one night for a couple of three hours. Some some of the, the folks that sat there with us, they had really no idea what was going on. I wish I could have gotten him to talk. I don't know that he would have felt any better. don't know it would have changed situations. Some folks, though, don't want to talk, and you can't make them talk, and so there's no use in trying to make them talk. It's the ones that you can get to talk that you need to get to talk. In getting to talk, we have to understand that we, and if they're going through anger, they have to analyze the situation. And sometimes it helps to talk it out, to find somebody, to find a third party, to say, okay, will you listen to this? Sure but analyze the situation, and then finally cool down. Cool down. Catch your breath. Cool down. It's a soft answer that turns away wrath, right? Proverbs 15 and verse 1. Soft answer. Turns away wrath. I like that verse. When we cool down, when calmer heads prevail, we find out that, that really we react and do better. Edwin Stanton was Secretary of War for um, Abraham Lincoln. Stanton didn't like a particular general in the Army. He thought that he had taken advantage of him. And so Lincoln, as Stanton had talked to Lincoln about it, Lincoln said, well, write him a letter. And so he wrote the letter, and he brought it to Lincoln to read, and Lincoln read it. 
He looked at Stanton. He said, what are you going to do with this letter? And he said, well, I'm going to send it to him. He said, no. He said, this is a fine letter. Well written, well stated. But he said, let me tell you, every letter that I've ever wrote, or written, excuse me, in anger, I've taken it and I've thrown it into the fire. And then I've written a second letter. And I've always been glad that I wrote the second letter. Stanton took his advice, threw the, the letter in the fire, wrote the second letter, sent it to, to the general. The problem was amended between the two. It's all because we gathered ourselves, we cooled down, and we talked. I share with you all of this to say that you might say, well, you know, preacher, I, I don't have a I don't have an anger issue. Well, that's wonderful. If you are calm of spirit and calm of heart and nothing riles you up, that's wonderful. But I'd venture to say that most of us at one time or another have gotten angry, grossly angry with someone. And sometimes have to go back and apologize. Straighten it out. Make it right. But victory over anger is possible. Don't be like the man that was a golfer that had a terrible round of golf. And so on the 18th hole, when he putted and missed and putted again and missed and putted again and missed, four putted it and it still didn't go in, he took his golf bag, picked it up, and he threw it in the pond that was right there. Stormed off the golf course, went to, to his car. Where's my keys? Oh, yeah. They're in my golf bag that's in the pond. And goes back to the pond to retrieve his golf or to retrieve his keys out of his golf bag, still fuming. When he jumped in, guess what he had forgotten? He didn't know how to swim and he drowned and he died. Anger will do it to you. It'll ruin relationships. It'll ruin good feelings that you have towards people. But we don't need to have those feelings, and we need to resolve that anger if it comes up between us. Can we win over anger? Sure. This evening, if you're not a New Testament child of God, or you need to rededicate your life, our prayer is that you'll come while together we stand and sing.